Thank you for, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here today to talk about privacy threat modeling. But before I dive into that topic, I'd like to take a quick detour and talk about something else that's really exciting. And that is going to an ice cream shop when you're a kid. You remember it when you were young, maybe you take your own kids there or your cousins. The kid enters, sees all those bright looking colors and will be like, oh, I want a scoop of each. Now, now that we're older, we realize probably not the best idea and you can see like all the ice cream starting to drip. So the parents typically go like, I don't think so. You don't, you won't be able to eat everything. Just stick to one or two scoops, that's all you need, otherwise it will get messy. This is actually also really great advice for anybody working with personal data. Do you really need it? If you don't, don't process it, don't collect it, otherwise it can get messy. More data, more responsibilities, more possibilities of problems. I will talk more about privacy and personal data in a bit. But I, I like to roll with this ice cream example for a bit longer and um, try to dissect what's going on in the parents' minds. So in those couple of seconds between the kids going, I want a scoop of each, till you reach the counter and narrow it down to, well, you can just have one scoop. So how I think it goes is you make this kind of mental image of like the big cone with lots of scoops. And because you have that mental image, you can start thinking about all the stuff you don't want to happen. It's ice cream, it will start to melt and make a mess. The more scoops you order, the more likely one will fall off. And, well, we all know those kids that start eating from the bottom of the cone, we don't want that. And yes, it's a nice looking color, but your kid doesn't like it, you will have to end up eating it, yuck. And, well, basically it's just way too much, so you will throw it away and that's a waste. So, that's all the stuff we don't want. So we can start thinking of how to resolve that. So, you tell your kid, well, two scoops is more than enough. And just stick to your favorite flavor, the neon stuff, you don't like it. And, well, just please get a cup, that will save some mess. Okay. Almost at the counter, we have like one second to reflect on this. Well, we had a big lunch, so maybe one scoop is enough. And, well, this is that different shop. And this is the place where your kid thinks that the salted, salted caramel tastes too salty and too caramelly. I know it sounds made up, but actually it's a real story. Um, <laughs> and, well, we have a cup, but just to be sure, let's get lots and lots of napkins. Okay, crisis averted, ready to order, let's enjoy that ice cream, right? And what we actually did here is threat modeling. We had these four questions that, without probably real realizing it, go through our head and make us come to that decision of just having one or two scoops. Um, it's not the four questions I came up with. It's a bit of a rephrasal of uh, the four question framework by Adam Shostak. Um, and basically those four steps describe any privacy threat modeling approach out there. Um, so maybe some of you will be like, okay, I follow the example, but aren't you taking this parenting thing a bit too far? I mean. I just take a box of wet wipes, what's the worst that can happen? The kid gets messy, the ice cream falls on the ground, big deal. And you're right for the ice cream example. But when we're dealing with personal data, with privacy, with security, we don't have that luxury. Wet wipes won't cut it. We cannot wait until the bad stuff happens. We don't have the luxury to learn by disaster. We have to act by design. And I know it's kind of a bold transition from ice creams to a house on fire, but I, I like to stress this point that we need to act by design uh, and not learn by disaster. Okay, so who am I? Why am I talking about this? Well, I like ice cream, obviously. Um, but, uh, well, most, most importantly, I'm a privacy researcher. Um, I actually started working as a security researcher 
switch to privacy and then realize that these cool things to, to, to think about by design weren't really there. So as Avi mentioned, we kind of got inspired by Stride and try to create our own approach for privacy, which is the Linden privacy threat modeling approach. I will talk uh, a bit about that later as well. Okay, so what will I talk about today? Well, privacy threat modeling. I will start with talking about why, what, and how of privacy, and then in the second part, talk about threat modeling with a focus on privacy. Okay, so privacy. I. I'm aware that this is not always a very well-received topic in the security community. There are some misconceptions there, so I will try to, uh, to debunk a couple of those. So let me start with telling you why I think privacy matters. And to talk about that, well, I actually want to do some buzzword bingo and see like what were the hot topics the past couple of years, the past decades. We have uh, digital transformation, we have Internet of Things, we have um, Industry 4.0, digital disruption. What do all of these have in common? Well, data, information, all information is being digitized. And I'm not just talking about these bits and bytes, the, the zeros and ones, I'm talking about personal data, information that affects us as individuals. Okay, but... I know there are some people that will be like, sure, but I don't really care. I mean, I do nothing wrong, so what's the big deal? I have nothing to hide. And it is a release that this is not a room filled with criminals, but I don't agree with this statement. Um, if we look at that statement in an offline world, I think it's kind of obvious we do have things to hide. If later today or tomorrow or whenever somebody comes up to you and um, you don't know the person and they start asking questions about the sports you do. I don't mean that in the sense like, hey, have you been working out? I really mean like starting asking questions like, hey, what sports do you do? Do you go biking? Do you go running? When do you do it? How often do you do it? Where do you do it? By the way, where do you live? Can I see pictures of your house? Is it expensive? Do you have many valuables in there? How do your kids look like? Are you in a relationship? How is the love life going? Are you planning to have kids anytime soon? I mean, that's really creepy, right? But because we are now living in a digital world and we have all these cool applications, smart devices, smart appliances, this is actually the information that is available online. Um, and that can cause quite some problems as well. I think most of you um, are aware of, of the story of Strava that released some privacy-aware uh, heat maps, aggregated data, and it ended up revealing some secret military bases. Clearly, we don't want that. But it's not just about national security. It can also impact us as individuals. Um, just a very recent study by some colleagues of mine um, showed that, well, they analyzed 1.4 million activities on Strava, um, which were entered by, by 4,000 users. And even though they had this kind of privacy parameter, uh, perimeter set, so you don't have the exact location of where a, a run started, they were still able to uh, deduce for 85% of those users the home address because, well, basically, that privacy setting does not hold up. And, well, why does it matter? Well, for instance, there might be some criminals lurking on the side trying to see, well, that's a, a fancy-looking bike. Let's see where we can go find it. And we actually know when the people, the, person are not, uh, the, the persons are, are not at home. Um, another recent example is um, the Roomba example. Uh, just last month, there was this MIT report that showed that um, there was a developer version of the, the vacuum cleaner, and um, it took lots of pictures, videos, all those pictures were annotated. And it's not just about cabinets, it's basically about all the stuff you own in your house. It's about your kids. There was even a picture of a woman on a toilet. And it's not just kind of weird that they are processing 
processing it, being a vacuum cleaner company, um, lots of these pictures actually ended up on social media. So we don't want that, obviously. And not even our sex lives are private, apparently. Um, and it's not only about all the stuff we put into the system, about the devices we use. It's because there's so much information available, available out there about us that more and more information can be combined and that there's even more to be learned from it about ourselves. For instance, it's a, it's a common fact that um, based just on your, your friends list on social media, it's easy to deduce your sexual orientation. Based on your shopping history, it's apparently quite easy to predict pregnancy based on buying unscented lotions and those kinds of things. But it goes even further. I mean, there are examples of smart meters that when they have sufficiently fine-grained um, readings, that you can deduce what TV shows are being watched based on the light-emitting patterns of your TV screen. So basically, there's so much more information that can be deduced about uh, all of us. And we're kind of dependent on the app developers, on the companies that provide us with this information that are processing all of our information to do that in a privacy-friendly, in a privacy-aware way. But why should they care? Why should you care? Why should you include privacy in your analysis, in your systems? Well, because it's the right thing to do, I think the examples before showed, and I, I'm, I'm an academic, I can be a bit idealistic, just it's the right thing to do. And we see more companies that are actually embracing privacy, embracing ethics, and really putting that as part of their company culture. We also see lots of companies using privacy as a competitive advantage. People switching to Signal because the WhatsApp policies suck. Um, Apple really using privacy in their advertisements to, sh to show, like, look, this is uh, important to us. Whether or not they are a really privacy-aware company, that's a different story, but at least they're embracing that competitive edge that privacy can have. And, well, studies show that it, it actually makes sense. It's a, a recent su study uh, focusing on the... Well, the controls you have, you, you, you give people about their privacy settings. And when you give a positive privacy experience, that increases the brand preference by 43%. The way around, when you have a negative privacy experience, that has almost as much uh, of a damaging impact to your reputation as an actual data breach. So clearly, we want to avoid it. Well, but it costs money, yes. Another study by Cisco uh, released this year, they did a survey of, of many companies um, about the privacy impact, the privacy importance, and it showed that on average, when you invest in privacy, you get 1.8 times the return on investment. And for more than 30% of the respondents, that was actually three to five percent, uh, three to five times the investment. So it's definitely something worth looking into. And if you're still not convinced, sorry, you kind of have to, because there's all these kinds of privacy regulations, uh, data protection legislation popping up, um, and they all enforce you to have data subject rights, data processing principles implemented that you follow privacy by default, privacy by design paradigms. Okay, so I get it, we have to follow it, but it doesn't apply to us as a company, it doesn't apply to our project, because we're not dealing with personal data, we're good. But are you? Well, maybe, but personal data is more than you probably realize it is. When we think of personal data, we think of social security numbers, addresses, um, name, date of birth, but it's also IP addresses, browser fingerprinting, cookie IDs, location data that's all sufficient to directly identify us. But personal data is even much more than that. Personal data is not only about information that directly identifies an individual. It's about 
all data related to a person that might be identifiable in the future. When later today, during a break, you would be gossiping about the blonde girl that talked about privacy in the morning, well, all those data items don't have something really identifiable on their own, but by combining just a couple of them, probably your conversation partner will know you're talking about me. So all those bits and pieces are personal information. Now, to the security versus privacy discussion. On the one hand, you have people saying, well, yeah, sure, privacy, it's, it's confidentiality. We're handling it, we're security experts, we got your back. On the other hand, you have people saying, well, I don't like you privacy people. You want like anonymity for everything and we want strong authentication and, and auditing and we cannot break that work. That's, this, both worlds cannot be combined. And I think both of these statements need a bit of nuance. So first I want to go through what is privacy. There's lots of definitions out there, but I thought I'd stick to the, like the foundation and the objectives of privacy, of privacy engineering. Um, similar to the stride CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, availability, there's also a privacy triad, which is intervenability, transparency, and unlinkability. Or if you like the more US NIST terminology, we have manageability, predictability, and disassociability. Different words, same meaning. So what do they mean? Let me give an example where I combine uh, intervenability and transparency first and then zoom into unlinkability. I think this is a pop-up, a banner we all see before. And well, basically we just click on the green button and move on with our lives. But this is a true example of a dark pattern. You have, um, oops, is this working? Yes. We have, well, yeah, you get the point. <laughs> we have all the information about what's going on, what's gonna happen with our information, kind of hidden, grayed out, small. We don't really read it. Are we giving them our email address? Are we selling their, our soul? We really don't know because it's kind of hidden. We're being nudged to select uh, the privacy friend, uh, the less privacy friendly option by the big green button that's calling out our name. Um, and then the opt out, the privacy friendly option is grayed out, is small and often described in such a way that you're like, well, I don't want to choose that option. And in addition, this is just a yes, no response. You don't have any fine grained controls to say, well, yeah, maybe I'm fine with my name, but not with my date of birth or whatever. So it both lacks transparency, being informed about what will happen to your information and sufficient control for you to actually decide how you want to tackle this. So that's, a quick example of these two terms. Then there's uh, unlinkability. And unlinkability is also quite a, a complex concept uh, that tackles quite a number of, well, I, I decided to list them here as, as threats. Uh, there's linking and identifying. I talked about them when I talked about personal data. So the more bits and pieces you can link together, the more likely you can single out an individual uh, and identify somebody. There's data disclosure, which relates to, um, not to information disclosure and confidentiality, but to minimality, to only sharing, processing that information that you really need. There's detecting, without having access to information you can still observe and deduce quite a lot. So it's kind of like side channel attacks. And then there's non-repudiation which I realize is a security property, but from a privacy perspective can be a threat. For some situations, we want plausible deniability. When we're going voting, we want to be able to deny who we voted for. Now, I'd like to give one more example of, of, of these, and I thought I would stick to the non-repudiation or plausible deniability example, and talk about menstruation. Now. No worries, no biology lesson here. I want to talk about period tracking apps. 
Still, what's the big deal? It's like a monthly recurring thing. Why do you need plausible deniability? Well, context, context matters. And context can change. Last year, Roe versus Wade was overturned, and that made uh, states, US states, decide for themselves whether they would support abortion rights or ban abortion. So in several states, abortion is now illegal. Um, health providers that perform it can be sued. Um, well, and in different countries, it's, it's a similar situation. So this context, this awareness of the context made some of these app uh, providers um, change their features and allow for, for instance, an anonymous use of the application. So context is also important when you think about privacy. So coming back to these two misconceptions, privacy does not need to conflict security. Yes, there are different uh, concepts, but when you tackle them early together, you can find a way to make them work. You can have some kind of anonymous use and still have some authentication, you can have like anonymous credentials or, or things like that. Non-repudiation and plausible deniability don't have to conflict. I've yet to come across a situation where they do. Um, even in the online voting example where you want to have plausible deniability about the fact who you voted for, for that same action, the fact that you voted, you can still have non-repudiation. So there's no need to worry. We can always find a way for security and privacy to work together. And yes, privacy and security are different, but you can tackle them in a very similar way. But you need to be aware of the, the different mindset it requires. When you're tackling privacy, uh, when you're tackling security, well, we want to protect data. We want to protect our data, the company data. When you're dealing with privacy, you want to protect personal data. You care about the individual, the data subjects involved. So you need to look at it from the perspective of the data subject, not from the perspective of the company. So rather than for security focusing on the bad attacker that we don't want to have um, any access to the system, we're focusing on the attacker as well, but also doing that reflection of our system, our organization. Is there any misbehavior? Are we um, kind of abusing this information and violating individuals' privacy rights. Okay. So, I talked about why privacy, what is privacy, now how can we implement privacy? Can we just bolt on some fancy crypto stuff, some privacy enhancing technologies at the end? Well, sure, you can try. Maybe it's not the best solution. I mean, when you're building a house, you will probably not wait until it's all finished to bring in the plumber and the electrician. You want them involved early so they can actually embed pipes and wires into the foundation. And it's the same for security, it's the same for privacy. We want privacy by design. Now, privacy by design is a concept that has been around since the 90s. Uh, it was introduced by Anke Vukian, who is a privacy commissioner in Canada. And together with the concept, she also listed a set of privacy by design principles to follow. Um, I summarized a couple of these uh, that I selected here for you. And so privacy by design means you have to tackle privacy proactively. Don't wait until it goes wrong really think about how you can fix it before it happens. If we want to cover the entire system, we want to do it in a, in a systematic way, and we want privacy to really be by design, so embedded into the development process, so it can have an impact on later design decisions. I think that sounds reason reasonable, that's the same for security. And it's great principles, but how do you put them in practice? It's still kind of fake, kind of abstract. So, well, there's actually this really cool thing, which is called threat modeling. And well, look, it's the same properties. That's great. So, what is threat modeling? It means that you analyze a system representation, a system model, to identify, to highlight security and privacy issues. Put differently, it means that you 
Think about what can go wrong early so you can fix it before it actually happens. And as the ice cream example showed, it's something we're used to do. We do it without realizing it when we're kind of juggling our day-to-day -day activities. It's not a new term. It has been around in the security community for more than 20 years now. I think Stride is probably the best known approach there. And it's equally useful for privacy, for privacy engineering. And I'm really excited to see that threat modeling is really a hot topic. Um, if you see the, the scribble here on, on the screen, it's uh, actually the Google Trends evolu uh, evolution of uh, the term threat modeling over the past 10 years. So you really see um, that, that upward trend. Um, and threat modeling is basically everywhere. Um, it's, it's part of OWASP's top 10 as, as part of the insecure uh, design uh, flaw. It's in several standards, guidelines, it's described by NIST, by FDA, a very recent ISO on privacy by design, also explicitly mentioned like, well, yes, you should do privacy threat modeling, so it's also uh, getting more traction in the privacy community. So why is threat modeling hot? Well, it's a great way to improve your security and your privacy posture. It's a known fact that fixing things early before they happen is much more cost efficient. And with all those new legislations, guidelines popping up that require you to do it, security, privacy by design, if you have this kind of systematic process and you document it accordingly, you actually also have evidence, have accountability about the fact that you, you comply with that requirement. And then there's bonus points uh, that you can receive uh, when you do threat modeling, when you get people together around the table, start thinking about all the things that can go wrong about the system, you're really being forced to get this shared understanding of the system, which is often still lacking. And just by talking about security, by talking about privacy, having these kinds of brainstorms, these analysis um, discussions, you have also a growing awareness about security and privacy. Okay, how do you do threat modeling then? Well, you kind of already know it. It's the same as we did for the ice cream example. It's just four basic steps. Um, what are we working on? What can go wrong? How are we going to fix it? Did we do a good enough job? That's the four steps as described by Adam. And well, I rephrased them a bit, but it's basically the same story. Yet there's this misconception that it needs to, it's a, it's a difficult thing that it's really hard to, to do. So I thought I would illustrate that it doesn't have to be, it can be easy, easy as child's play, I would say. So I thought I would illustrate it with a doll. Why a doll? Well, this is a really interesting doll for a privacy analysis because this doll got banned from Germany. Um, I will not spoil why. Let's go through the threat model together. So the first thing we do is we want to understand what's going on here, what's the situation. So we want to have a model. We want to typically get a data flow diagram for Stride, for Linden, but basically anything you have will do. If you have a whiteboard sketch, if you have client server view, swim lane, whatever you have, there's not one perfect model. Um, the more information you have, the better. For privacy, at least, you need to be aware of what information you have, what information you will pro process, how does it flow through the system. So, for the doll, um, the doll is actually called My Friend Kayla. My Friend Kayla is a Bluetooth-enabled device. So, how does it work? Let's do kind of a whiteboard sketch, or as I like to call it, a DFD with pretty pictures. So we have a doll that is connected to the parent's phone through Bluetooth, and the voice recordings, the questions are being sent there to the back end. The voice recordings are being processed, a response is being created and forwarded back to the doll. And there's also some external voice analytics going on. So really high level, I realize that it will be sufficient for this example. Okay, so. We know what's going on here, now what? We want to know what, what, what can go wrong, but how do you do that? 
Let's look, look back at the ice cream example. How did we come to that idea of all the things that could go wrong? How did we know it would get messy? Well, maybe it got messy before and we learned. Maybe we had friends or family say, well, don't do that. It's going to get messy. And that's basically what we also need for a security analysis, for a privacy analysis. We want that predefined knowledge that we can reuse. So that's why I think uh, approaches such as Stripe, such as Linden, are useful because they give that kind of reusable knowledge. They make this overview of uh, information classified according to um, security categories as um, encompassed in the acronym STRIDE or privacy uh, threat categories as encompassed in the acronym LINDEN. So STRIDE has been around for more than 20 years, created by Microsoft, and we got inspired to do something similar for privacy, which is LINDEN. LINDEN has been around for more than 10 years, and we have been working on updating uh, and extending it. So how does such a knowledge base look like? Well, let's have a, a peek at... Um, at Linden, so similar to Stride, Stride has threat trees that describe like common attacks. Um, we have the same for Linden. We have these threat trees of which the nodes describe generic privacy issues for each Linden category in combination with a DFD element. Maybe you don't like trees. Fine. We also have a set of cards that, again, inspired by. Uh, by security, by uh, the Elevation of Privilege uh, card game by Adam Shostak. Um, so we have these cards that describe very similar, uh, well, the same threads, but in a, in a different uh, coding. We have um, support questions that help you guide through this assessment. So how do you use this? Well, let's look at one of the trees. I know sometimes people are a bit scared um, to use it, so let's just Look at one of these trees. This is about identifiability of a data flow. For this example, we're just going to focus on a snippet, which is identifiability of the data itself. And, well, do we have identifiable content? Yes, we do. We have voice recordings. Voice recordings are both the content, can be identifiable, can be sensitive con uh, context, uh, content, and the voice itself is unique and identifiable. Now, if you look at the um, flow between the doll and the device, well, it's Bluetooth. And uh, researchers have shown that it's really insecure. You can eavesdrop on it for uh, on a distance up to 15 meters. Uh, well, yeah, it's Bluetooth, uh, but it's not en encrypted. And, um, well, it's also possible to do kind of a man-in-the-middle attack and talk to the kids from a distance of 15 meters through the doll. So, well, people don't really like that for their kids. Um, still focusing on that voice data, but moving to a, a different flow, we're actually looking at the, the flow to the voice analytics company um, because, well, it turns out it's not really a, trust, a trusted receiver. Um, it turns out that it also does some voice analytics for US military, and that kind of freaked out a lot of parents. So the combination of these two threats made Germany decide to ban the doll as a spionage device, and also got it removed from several stores. So obviously this is something that we should not have in, in toys, and that could have been found by doing this kind of privacy analysis up front. So, we know what can go wrong. What will we do about it? Well, we want to fix it, right? Um, well, typically you start with prioritizing threats. You will do an assessment of risk, so look at impact, look at likelihood. You can go for a very formal approach, uh, very quantified. You can do more a, a guesstimate approach, like, well, I think impact is low, and I think likelihood is medium. Um, and everything in between there. And then there's the mitigation, the solution. But there's so much uh, work out there, so how do you find that specific solution that works for you? Well, the advice there is to first start scoping 
a more generic tactic, a more generic strategy? Will I generalize information? Will I remove information? Will I inform my, the individuals involved? And when you narrow down that generic scope, that generic tactic, you can then go lower and look at privacy patterns, look at privacy enhancing uh, techniques or pets. So just really high level, look at the, the doll example. How will we resolve it? Well, one of the obvious solutions is let's hide the information being sent between the doll and the device. So yes, this is security. Security is important for privacy too. Um, what else can we do? Well, we can maybe have the doll do the uh, speech to text translation. Then at least the recordings don't have to be sent. And that might already reduce a bit of the impact in case something would go wrong, in case security would break. If we do have to send the voice recordings, well, let's do an abstraction. Let's only send scrambled information to the analytics company. Let's, let's, um, minimize what we send. Let's, do, let's remove the link between the questions and the actual profiles. So we can do lots of tiny things that can all help to increase the privacy of the users. Okay. Are we done? Well, that's actually the final question. Are we done? We had a look at a very high level system model. So maybe we should dive into the backend in more detail. We have this idea of um, strategies, tactics. Once implemented, is there any residual risk? Well, that's something we have to find out by doing this again. So basically, this is a continuous process. I talked about Linden, I talked about Stride, but of course there's much more out there in the, in the threat modeling world. You have approaches that focus more on the process, on the steps, and help you through it. You have approaches that focus more on the knowledge, security, privacy. Um, and then there's, while I'm sharing resources, some really interesting books here. Um, there's the Threat Modeling Manifesto. I will talk about that uh, in the next slide, too. And there's this new community, the Threat Modeling Connect community, that's actually doing a, a Threat Modeling Hackathon next month for which you can still register, I think, until the 19th. So all really great resources to look into. Now, some, I talked about how to do threat modeling, so I'd like to take a couple more minutes to talk about how to do it successfully. And to do so, I will refer and reference the Threat Modeling Manifesto. So the Threat Modeling Manifesto is a a great document created by a group of threat modeling experts, uh, and I've been really honored to collaborate with them. Um, and the Threat Modeling Manifesto basically um, combines all the expertise, the experience, the vision of those people, and ha has distilled it into a set of principles, values, and patterns. So it's only a couple of minutes read. Go have a look after it's at threatmodelingmanifesto.org. Um, one of the first um, I want to, I want to talk about is well, I just showed you this list of a lot of threat modeling approaches. I'm sure I missed a couple. So the next question I often get is, okay, but it's so many. Where do I get started? Well, I know I will sound like a lawyer, but it depends. It really depends on your needs, on your requirements. Maybe you're looking for a very systematic, formal, structured approach. Um, and within the Linden range, that would be like using the trees, having mapping tables similar to Stride. Um, if you want a more lean approach, you can have a look at the cards. They will, they are more entry level. They will guide you there. You have people who look just at the high level categories, do a quick brainstorm of a couple of minutes and think of, okay, linking, what can go wrong? Detecting, what can go wrong? Um, and it's the same for strides. There also you have kind of 50 shades of approaches to, to stride alone. And then there's different approaches as well. So it really depends. If you want my biased opinion on starting with privacy threat modeling, I would say have a look at Linden and probably the Linden Go cards are the most, um, most lean, the most entry level there. 
Well, I talked about privacy by design, security by design, having threat modeling early in this cycle. But does, it, does that mean that that's the only place or the only time to do it? Well, no. The sooner the better, but never too late. So a great quote by, by Avi and, uh, and Steven. Um, even if the system is already up and running, of course, of course you can still threat model. You should threat model. You should find out what's still wrong, what are the residual risks for security, for privacy, and implement them in the next iteration. So threat modeling, of course, is a great approach. A final um, piece of advice there to make it a true success, make it have meaning, make it have value. So what does that mean? Maybe you've done an excellent job at threat modeling. You have this nice report. You hand it over to the team lead, to the uh, manager, whoever, and they say, wow, thank you. We appreciate it. And then they file it somewhere in the bottom drawer. That's not a success, that's a waste of time, of effort. It's only successful when the output is really used as input for the subsequent steps, when there are requirements uh, extracted from it, when it's used to create testing scenarios, then it has value. So, being a researcher, also often the question pops up like, okay, the future of threat modeling, how does it look like? I'm as curious as all of you to see what will happen in this really cool domain. Um, I do have some hunches um, that I, I like to say a couple of words about. Um, so the first thing that for me as a researcher and as a threat modeling approach designer is really interesting is flexibility. Um, I talked about like the 50 shades of stride, the 50 shades of linden. There's different needs um, to all teams but still we're all working kind of with the same process. We, we have the same four steps. We all have the same security knowledge, privacy knowledge that we want to include. So how can we, as a, a provider of these, this information, make that um, flexible, to provide flexibility in, well, maybe those people want a more brainstorm approach, those people want a very formal approach. How can we make that information more flexible. Then there's automation. Threat modeling is often still a manual process, so it's labor intensive. There's more and more tools there, more mature tools coming up, and that's great because I think the more support we can have, documenting, extracting threats will help in the adoption. And then finally, I think also a great um, or an interesting um, Evolution there is having more integration in DevOps, having your, your threat model done kind of in isolation and then not actually being embraced by the developers, that's a waste. So we're also looking into, well, we, the community, is also focusing on um, runtime threat modeling, adaptive threat modeling, um, threat modeling as code, extracting system models from code so that you can really have that integration, that alignment with DevOps practices. So that kind of concludes my, my taste of uh, privacy threat modeling. So I have uh, just some final ice cream wisdom before I let you go. Um, whenever next time you're thinking of collecting, processing, storing personal data, think of the messy ice cream example. Think about do you really need it? If you don't, well, avoid a brain freeze, avoid a headache, don't let it get messy. If you don't need it, don't collect it, don't process it. Reduce the information to the strict minimum. Big data means big problems, so reduce it as much as possible. And then concerning threat modeling, well, there's lots of approaches out there. Start small, small start with a small project, start with a, a kind of a, a low entry approach, see how it works for you, tweak it and mature as you go. Um, as the threat modeling manifesto describes, who should threat model? Well, it's you, it's me, it's everybody. Everyone can and should do threat modeling. So let's get started. And thank you for your attention.
amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do have a few minutes for questions. Sure. Okay. Ah, that's a, an interesting one. Um, well, I think the more lean approaches, such as the Elevation of Privilege card game by Adam, or, um, well, yeah, I'm kind of biased, but our privacy threat modeling Lin and Go cards are, I think, the most like easy way to get started, to get familiar with the knowledge, and to get familiar with it in a more, uh, well, in a less formal way, because, well, you have also very strong, uh, strict approaches where you make this big mapping table and you follow it, and it gives you support, but it can be really overwhelming. So I personally would not get started with like the very formal structured approaches. <coughs> yeah? There are various um, tools for threat modeling, particularly security ones. Do any of them include any privacy options, you know, sort of any of the concepts? Um, yeah, so we have, well, we, you have OWASP Threat Dragon, uh, and that also has as support for the, the privacy categories for the Linden uh, categories, so that's definitely there. Um, I think some tools are looking into privacy. I'm, I'm not that familiar with, with how, how far they are in privacy. I think, well, privacy is still a, with newer domain and security, so also the adoption there and the need for like having systematic support there is still growing. Um, and it's typically a different community than the security community, so I'm hoping that soon those two communities will kind of find each other and, and there will be more um, evolution there as well. Yeah? What's the licensing structure on the Linden Go cards? Uh, well, it's all free to use, so um, everything is freely available on the website. We're actually also working on an update there, so it should launch soon, which I hopefully in like a month or two, uh, there will be some more information there as well. There's one in the back, yeah. Um, a bit, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so privacy testing and, and, and the future there. Um, well, I can only hope so. Yeah, I, 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 I hope we're going there, but I think even having security metrics is already still tricky sometimes, so having them for privacy is also not straightforward. So I, I think there's some work there, but it's, it's, it's not as mature yet as, as I hope it will be soon. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Um, so I, I think both security and privacy threat modeling can be done together because basically you're starting from the same model. So as long as you keep that, that difference in mindsets in, in the back of your head that for privacy you need to look at it from the user, the individual's perspective, I think it can be combined. Um, so yeah, the, the OWASP Threat Dragon has support for both at the same time. Um, I would get... I don't know, it, for privacy, you probably also would like to have a lawyer there as well to also help you tune it a bit to, okay, well, we think this, but the law says, says maybe a bit different, so that might make it slightly different, but I, I think overall it's the same approach, so it shouldn't be that difficult to, to combine them. The, the um, ISO 31700 on privacy by design actually mentions, well, you should do privacy threat modeling and ideally augment it onto existing security threat modeling approaches. There's one more question. Uh, 
Whew, that's a difficult question. And I think there will be some sessions later today and tomorrow by people who will tackle like all those bits and pieces. Um, I, I think you have to figure out again for your context what matters. I, I, I know like bigger companies who will make this list of, well, this is the, the, the information that we see as most sensitive or most valuable. So when things change there or when, when features change that have an impact there, well, that's the time to, to reiterate because if you do it like for each tiny feature, it will indeed blow up. But yeah, it depends. Sorry. 